Hello, I'm Lizzie Burden. Welcome to What Economics is Missing, brought to you by the International Economic Association, together with Project Syndicate, to mark the launch of the Women in Leadership in Economics initiative. Economic decision making affects everyone, wherever we are in the world. So you'd hope that the policy research behind it reflects all of our experiences and concerns. But there's something missing, and that's women. Yes, half the world's population is underrepresented in the profession, especially in the global south, meaning women's perspectives and needs aren't properly addressed in devising the policies which affect all of our lives. So what's to be done? How can we attract more women to economics? How and why does it really make a difference? We'll be running through those questions and more with our distinguished panel who are ready and raring to go. And we wanna hear from you. What do you think? So please join us on your socials and help share the word about today using the hashtag what economics is missing. But first, let's take a look at the scale of the problem. Now I'm delighted to be able to introduce our absolutely splendid panel for this session. Vera Songwe is Chair of Liquidity and Sustainability Facility and Co-Chair of the High Level Panel on Climate Finance. Raquel Fernandez, Professor of Economics at NYU and Director of Women in Economics in Latin America and the Caribbean. Ashwini Deshpande is Professor of Economics at Ashoka University. And Manu Shafiq, President and Vice-Chancellor of the London School of Economics and the new incoming President of, the Colum of Columbia University, the first woman ever to hold that post. Congratulations, Manoush. We'll hear from you all in just a moment, but first, Danny Roderick, President of the International Economic Association and Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard University, Harvard Kennedy School on the challenge. Economics is about effective and efficient use of resources. That's what economists are supposed to be talking about and researching. In our own discipline, we are wasting human resources to an unimaginable degree by not fully taking advantage of the capabilities and the skills of one half of humanity. To make economics more useful, uh, to address our real world problems, we'll have to have a much greater diversity of views and much fuller representation of women in the profession at all levels. There's a certain culture within economics that tend to discourage women from entering the field, from staying in the field, from rising in the field. And I think that sort of culture that's sort of specific uh, to economics is beginning to change in some countries in, in North America and Western Europe, but there's still a lot to do in the low and middle income countries, especially where our project for the International Economic Association will focus on. I'm delighted that the Project Syndicate is hosting and co-organizing this event with us, the International Economic Association as it is our launch event for a major new initiative that the IEA is beginning to undertake on women in leadership in, in economics. Our project wants to take these ideas and wants to apply them and broaden them to environments in countries in the global south and low and middle income countries where we have not made as much progress. 
So we want to actively engage with the economics profession in these countries, and we want to understand what specifically the problems are. I think one of the mistakes we would make is simply applying the solutions and the remedies that we've applied in the United States or in Western Europe and simply take them over to problems that might be faced by economists in South Africa or India or in Mexico. So that's the evidence base in which we're going to engage both by developing the quantitative and qualitative uh, survey-based evidence. The second part is the component of amplifying women's voices. So we want to reach out to economists and researchers, women economists in, in the developing world who don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to access professional networks, global platforms, various forms of media, and don't necessarily or aren't encouraged to transform their writing and their research and ideas and present it in ways that can be disseminated, that can be placed on these global platforms. Our project aims to fundamentally alter the economics profession by removing obstacles to women's participation in leadership positions in the economics discipline through research, through understanding where those obstacles are, and through a variety of activities that will amplify women economists' voices in the global public sphere. Ensuring that women are represented and can rise to positions of leadership in the economics profession is important not just as a matter of equity and inclusion, but it's also important to make economics a more effective and a more relevant discipline. Great food for thought there from Danny. Now let's put some of those thoughts to our panel. Vera, in your old job as Under Secretary General at the United Nations, you had an incredible overview of how the world works. How is the gender imbalance in academic economics affecting policy making? Here in the UK, only now, for example, is childcare at the top of the economic agenda in 2023. No, thank you. Thanks again. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be on this panel with uh, three other very, very distinguished uh, female economists. I think, um, first of all, the problem is real. And, and we see it a lot in, uh, in, in, in on the continent. In my old job, for example, I think one of the areas where we saw it was just trying when I joined the institution, the gender balance was 26% women and trying to bring it to 40. First, you have to find the women and it was very difficult to get them because the few that exist are taken. But secondly, I think one of the, the, the problem is very costly for us because we don't then make the right economic decisions for the continent particularly when we are trying to use very scarce resources, you have to make sure that every dollar is very well spent. But when you only have you know, male leaders making the decisions or male economists making the decisions, very often we find ourselves in meetings where there's two women contesting a solution because we've lived it or we understand or we know somebody who's lived it and we know it's not going to work. And I think it's it's just common sense that uh, if 50% of the population is women, you need to have 50% of the population contributing to policy. But the problem starts uh, not at that level. And that's, I think, one of the, the, the issues that most of us face is that when you get to, you know, on the Secretary General of the UN or you know, chair of the liquidity facility, then you say, I need a woman to be the number two and you can't find them because we haven't built a pipeline. So it's really about education. It's back to how many girls are we putting through school? How many girls are we making sure can actually go through the economics profession? And actually and next to STEM, economics is one of the professions where women, 38% uh, of sort of graduate students are economists. And this has stayed the same. I think uh, Maria Fernandez, you've done more of this research than I. We don't see that number increasing in many parts of the world. And so there's it, it's sort of a sticky uh, 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 impossibility to cross that mark. And until we cross it and get enough women through the pipeline, it's very difficult then when we need to find them to see them and get them. I definitely want to come back to that pipeline. But speaking of university economics departments, Manoush Shafiq, as president and vice chancellor at the London School of Economics, let me put some comments to you from David Miles at the Office for Budget Responsibility here in the UK. He has described academic economics as a testosterone fueled bear pit. But other female economists have told me that that's insulting because it implies that women can't cope with the cut and thrust of economic debate. Where do you stand on that? So I do think there is uh, there is a bit of an issue with the culture of economics, and you know there was recently a furor around 
uh, some debates that were online around uh, recent graduates competing for jobs and the kind of comments that people made were were pretty aggressive and uh, and and not very female friendly, let's say. Um, having said that, I think part of the problem is a numbers problem. You know, there aren't enough young women coming into economics. I remember when I was doing my PhD in Oxford, I think I was, as far as I knew, I was the only woman doing a PhD in economics in my time. And the numbers are not great at the moment. And a part of that is because what the general public thinks econ economists do is out of sync with reality. A colleague of mine here at the LSC, Oriana Bandiera, did some work polling the public and did some word clouds about what words come up when you're asked, what do you think economists do? And the number one word that came up for the public was money. But if you actually look at what economists talk about in journal articles, if you look at, say, the last 40 years of the top five journals in economics, the, the number one words that come out of that are evidence and impact. And so I think a lot of of young women, when they look at the field, think that, oh, I'll just talk about money and models all the time. When in fact, what economists really do is worry about questions like poverty and inequality and human welfare and efficiency and trade and all sorts of fascinating issues that all of us have worked on, which I think is a much more compelling story to change the culture in the field. And Raquel, you're a director at WELAC, the women economists in Latin America and the Caribbean. How did what Manu Shafiq said there chime with a more typical experience in parts of the global south that you work with? So I'm at New York University, so actually it chimes very much with NYU. In Latin America, and that's one of the main objectives of the project that we're doing, Try hard to know the numbers. What we like did, and we like as women in, in economics in Latin America and the Caribbean, it's part of LACENA, the Latin American Caribbean Economic Association, uh, which is the preeminent organization for economists in Latin America and the Caribbean. What we did was to create a survey to look at the gender balance, or maybe imbalance is a better term, across economics departments, top economics departments in 10 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we found very num numbers that are very similar to those in the U.S. and in Europe, somewhere between 25% um, total of faculty being uh, women. But these vary widely across institutions and also across countries. And, you know, the main... Uh, question that we're facing is how can we change this? And that's uh, the question that the project that we're involved in, uh, with is aimed at change. Um, so definitely uh, the numbers that Moosh talked about very much resonate with me. Um, there's been a few interventions that have been done now or in the middle of or starting in the United States that I know about. One of them is really, you know, what is it that turns women off from economics? And this is, happens fairly early. It happens even before they get to college. Already, in terms of declaring intended majors, from the evidence that we have, far fewer women and tend to major in economics than men do. But even when you look at principles of economics class, which a large fraction of students take, in the United States, at the very least, and I assume in other countries as well, uh, women tend to be put off, I think, by the material, but also by the lack of their own. One very interesting intervention that was done, uh, and this is a study that is published in the American Economic, uh, the Journal of the, uh, the AEJ uh, Applied, is that it looked at an intervention in uh, Southern Methodist University where they had two women come in and speak for 15 minutes. And these were women who were not uh, economists in the sense of being professional economists necessarily, but who had felt that economics made a difference to their career. And what they found is that just being exposed to these women, these were 15 minute uh, interventions, increased the, uh, the 
number of women who went on to uh, major in economics at this university by not, I think it was eight or nine percentage points, almost double the percentage of women that major in economics traditionally at this university. So this very rigorously done experiment showed that the absence of role models really makes a difference to the point that even a short, a short exposure to women who talked positively about economics and the influence it had in their career made a large difference. Ashwini, is there a problem if you fix the pipeline but not the culture and then women enter economics and they discover that they don't like it and they leave? Yeah, uh, before I get to that, I actually want to just highlight that uh, one of the uh, aims of this project is to document the diversity in underrepresentation which I believe is not uniform across the world. So for example, if you look at India, the country that I come from, more than 50% of master's students in economics are women. Uh, this is a proportion that's higher actually than the United States. And if you look at the elite uh, universities and colleges, about 30% of faculty on average are female, which is of course less than 50% what you know that you had as, as, as uh, master's students. Um, but it's actually also a little bit higher than the United States. So I think that there's a there's a very strong case to be made to get a nuanced picture of underrepresentation, to look at the pipeline and to see where the gaps are larger or smaller in which country, and because that will direct the solutions uh, that um, you know that that we need to find. So when you think of some you know economists from India, for example, right? They uh, there's also there's a gender problem, but also in the international stage, there's also a north south problem. So when you think of you know global experts on issues, you, India is not the country that you are uh, highly likely to think of. You know it's going to be more North American or maybe European economists that are going to be regarded as experts. And one of the aims of this project is, in addition to figuring out what solutions we need to fix the leaky pipeline. We also want to emphasize the point that expertise, A, is not a male domain, and expertise is not on, does not only reside in the global north. So there is a great deal of expertise coming from women economists in the global south, which also needs to be amplified. And that's really what, what uh, the amplification of female voices component is going to do. And what we see, and there are papers on this, which show how the range of topics that economics can address uh, diversifies and becomes much more real and interesting as female um, uh, you know, authorship increases. So when you look at the range of papers that women economists write, you know, they're going to look at labor laws, they're going to look at equality, they're going to look at uh, maternity leave, uh, all kinds of issues, which earlier did not were not considered mainstream economics, right? So Economics is about human problems, and I think the entry of women or the presence of a substantial number of female economists actually makes the, the palette much richer and much bigger. And I, so I think there's, there's all kinds of reasons to fix this problem, which is what this project is doing through the IEA. And Manoush, in his I mean, opening I, remarks. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, can I just add something to that? Because I think that I, think I completely agree with that. And one good example is uh, a faculty colleague here at the LSC, Shwati Dingra, who's an Indian woman economist, yes. who was one of the um, leading commentators on the Brexit debate, a very UK issue. She now serves on the Monetary Policy Committee, setting UK interest rates, along with a Latin American woman, uh, Silvana Trenero, who, so we got two women from developing countries opining and voting on UK interest rates, which is, again, Pretty untraditional, but a fantastic mm. breakthrough, I think. That's excellent, yeah. The sad thing about the Bank of England is that you've got Catherine Mann at one end of the spectrum and Silvana Tenreiro and Swati Dingra at the other end of the spectrum. So it seems that the next decision, it's going to come down to the men in the middle <laughs> to make the decision. Uh, we're back there again. But Manoush, in his opening remarks, Danny Roderick said that there has been some progress in recent years in Europe and the US. From what you've seen, is that translating into a smaller pay gap, gender pay gap in economics? 
Yeah, so um, there, there is there is a shrinking gender pay gap, but there still is one in economics. And, you know, we've all been working really hard to try and reduce it. You know, the biggest explanation of the pay gap is when women have children. Uh, because during those years, they are less productive than men. Uh, and I think in academic economics, there's also a huge problem because the period of fertility for many women coincides with the tenure clock. And so those years when you're expected to be the most productive, be producing those fantastic bits of research, which are going to get you tenure, are often coinciding with the years when you need to, to, you, you need to bear children. And so I think one of the things we've thought a lot about is how do you adjust for that so that women don't, aren't, don't, don't lose out and end up resulting in a pay gap. So for example, do you move the tender, tenure clock? Do you make it more flexible so that you can do it later? Uh, as a way to enable women to be able to have children, but also continue to progress in their careers. There's a very nice piece of research that was done for scientists called Lost Marie Curies. And they looked at when female scientists published and particularly patented inventions relative to male scientists. And invariably, during the childbearing years, women had made did, did less research and had fewer patents than their male equivalents. But they caught up in their 40s and 50s, and in those years, actually produced more than their male equivalents. And so I think finding ways to change the structure of careers so that female talent is able to come to the fore is a really important issue. And Vera, Danny Roderick also said that it would be a mistake to simply apply what's worked in the global north to the south and expect it to work. While that's surely true, there must also be some good lessons, that good practice we were just talking about that can be applied, not least professional bodies or institutions recognizing the issue. Yes, I think so. And and um, I, I want to come back also to what Minush said about sort of the time clock. I think one of the things that we are beginning to see a little bit on the continent is also because of digitization that people can work at home and so you get more women uh, in schools doing, and, and I believe that there is a strong correlation between mathematics and women going, uh, studying economics, because there is a sense that, you know, if to be a good economist, you have to be, uh, you know, know some amount of math, and there is contention even within the field about how much math we need to do economics. But increasingly, as we see more girls doing better at STEM, we're also seeing on the continent more girls getting into economics. Now, on the issue of, of solutions and diagnosis, um, I think there's a paper that says we cannot all disagree forever. So there's a few things that we all agree are good and, and must be done in economics. And I think that, you know, a lot of that is sort of just the basics. You know, you need to have uh, at least 10 towards a, a balanced budget, you know, in given that we are all talking about liquidity and uh, solvency crises, that, you know, uh, good fiscal management and good tax uh, to GDP ratios are a good thing. I think those are stable. But I think where the difference in what Danny Roderick maybe was talking about is how do you get to, you know, the right uh, uh, revenue to GDP uh, balance? How do you get to the right debt to GDP? What is it exactly that we're talking about? When you think about, you know, the United States in the era of low interest rates, there was a conversation about, you know, the U.S. can borrow as much as it, it wanted to. But if you are a developing economy that does not have hard currency, then you cannot uh, uh, implement the same kinds of policies. And I think that that is where sometimes you have those nuances. So there is some um, um, similarities and I think areas where we all agree on what needs to be done. But then there are differences e exactly because... You know, our geographies are different. Our constituencies are different. We are maximizing very different sometimes social welfare functions. And so the minute you inject those things into it, then we have to change uh, the conversations. And that's when you need more homegrown economies to be able to tell you what are the tensions, what are the opportunity costs of taking one decision against another. Now, just a quick reminder that we'd love it if you could chip in and share the word today. Just jump in on your social media using the hashtag what economics, economics is missing. Raquel, today's event is the launch of the International Economic Association's Women in Leadership in Economics initiative. You're heavily involved in that. Can you tell us a bit more about what it hopes to achieve? Danny did a very good job of describing the three prongs of what the uh, program is really going to be about. One is to build an evidence base, another is to amplify women's voice, 
And our last one is to actually build synergy among organizations and professional bodies um, so as to kind of spread the uh, encouragement of and uh, removing obstacles to women's advancement in economics. Um, so we have a project that is going to be taking place both in India, in Africa, and in Latin America. And what we're doing is we're focusing in depth on three countries in Latin America, Argentina, uh, Colombia, and Mexico, three countries in Africa, and in India. I think Ashwini is going to tell you more about the qualitative part of our study, which is really important and quite innovative. Uh, but the first really important step is simply evidence gathering. We have not a lot of evidence because all of this is in its infancy, but we have some evidence for the United States. In fact, there's an important study that's been undertaken that's called the Undergraduate Women in Economics Challenge. And one of the early findings that's come out of there is that women tend to be much more grade sensitive than men. So when they take a principles of economics class, if a woman gets a B plus in principles, she has a 27% chance of majoring in economics, whereas a man who gets a B plus in the principles class has a 41% chance of majoring in economics. Women are really dissuaded by grades, and it's only when they both get A's that they reach parity in terms of what's the probability of becoming of declaring economics as their major. So these type of really elementary facts, you know, is there a more grade sensitivity? What interventions help? The importance of mentoring. That type of evidence is coming from the United States. So in addition to simply documenting the fact for uh, the rest of the world, uh, what we are interested in doing is getting in-depth knowledge of what interventions work and why in different contexts. The context in Argentina is likely to be quite different than the context in India. So being uh, cognizant of the different obstacles and challenges faced by women, the sort of systematic biases or structural biases that might exist in different countries, it's really important to be able to formulate the correct type of interventions rather than simply saying this works for everyone. Um, How much of a difference can like bodies to... like the IEA really make? I'm sorry. Ashwini, how much of a difference can bodies like the IEA really make? So IEA is a professional uh, association. It's a, it's a network of economists. And so it the ability of IEA to directly intervene and change the status quo is limited, of course. But I think it's very important for international uh, fora such as the IEA to uh, explicitly take a stand in favor of gender equality to bring this issue onto the table. This starts a conversation. We already, as Raquel said, we are going to be gathering our evidence in seven countries, which is, which is a very tiny fraction of the global south. But these countries are important countries. They produce professional economists. And so we believe that the evidence that we are going to get from these seven countries will also inform our understanding of other contexts. More importantly, it has a signaling effect. It has, it, it changes the way in which people think. It changes people's culture and to, to make re everyone realize that you cannot just ignore female voices, uh, both in at the level of faculty hiring, as well as at the level of expertise. And when, you know, when, when you want policy briefs to be written or op opinion pieces to be written, et cetera. Having said that, I also want to point out, you know, the Minush talked about uh, tenure, uh, how tenure, the tenure clock coincides with the, you know, uh, the, the time when women tend to have children if they've decided to have children. And uh, sometimes we have to also understand that well-meaning policies can end up having perverse impacts. And one of the things that our project seeks to do is going to figure out what exactly the impacts of which policies are going to be. So the policy that I'm referring to is uh, giving paternal and maternal leave and extending the tenure clock for both the father and the mother. And there's a paper which shows that when tenure clocks get extended for both mothers and fathers, who are both researchers, men actually uh, publish more. They use the extra year mm. to catch up on their research and actually to do more research. Whereas women, that extra year actually goes in childcare. You know, so as mm. long as the norm of sharing the childcare burden equally does not change, you might have a very well-meaning policy, but with a perverse impact. 
Now notice that this is in North America. So when we th think of the global South and the global North and we think of different social norms, I think we need, I also want to uh, emphasize that we need to problematize the conversation a little bit more. I don't think norms are so as black and white as, you know, between the, between the South and the North as we, as they appear at first glance. So I think there are shades of gray in both uh, contexts. And uh, one of the things that uh, the IEA project has is a qualitative component where we'll be tracking uh, women at the cusp of a um, change. So for example, women going from undergraduate to graduate, et cetera, and they're gonna be tracking them for three years. Uh, so I think that's going to give us a lot of insight into what the actual constraints are that prevent women from uh, you know, advancing further. I knew I could count on my panel of economists to tell us about the unintended consequences. <laughs> I know that you are also fans of surveys as economists, so I want to do a bit of a quick fire round. Please raise your hand if you have witnessed firsthand what you would consider to be clearly sexist behaviour in the economics profession. Four out of four. Okay. <laughs> Please could you raise your hand if you've found your gender has been a barrier in your career as an economist? Mm. Interesting. I, I don't know. Half. Yeah. Half. Why, <laughs> why, why, why Manoush? Well, in my case, I certainly found myself being encouraged to do more girly subjects in economics. So, oh, why don't you work on human resources and labor. And I'm like, but I'm an international macroeconomist. And so the, my gender definitely was a factor in how people wanted to see me and encourage me to move in certain directions rather than subdisciplines of economics, which tended to be more male, where I was discouraged from going there. And I kind of stuck to my guns. And Raquel, as women's the, careers I, progress, sorry, go ahead. I can come in there. I think, uh, interesting, Minoush, because I think for me, because I, I have the gender and the race, I tended to be pushed to the race. You know, why don't you do something soft in, in Africa, right? right. right. So, so if there was a global monetary crisis, I couldn't have a view. I had to have a view about Africa. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, in that case, I think it was my race that was the more dominant factor. That's interesting to get the intersectionality perspective. And Raquel, as women's careers progress, the less likely they are to stay in economics. I wonder what you think can be done about that in particular? That's a great question. Uh, we probably would need to make it context specific. Uh, I think that's kind of the general method of our project, that we need to understand the context in which it takes place. I think mentorship, is important, I think, knowing what the barriers are. In other words, the fact that men are maybe over optimistic or over, uh, you know, confident in many areas, maybe that works to their advantage. How can we advantage women in a similar fashion? Or how can we change how much particular self confidence over self confidence matters? I think the most important thing is going to happen at different levels. I mean, what is simply the female share of undergraduate majors? In India, as you were saying, it's 50%. In the United States, it's about 30%. Uh, in Latin America, it's about, I think it depends again on the country. I would say it's probably around 40%. Uh, so it's, 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 it's pretty much higher. A lot of it is, you know, Trying to change expectations. There's a very interesting experimental paper and also evidence based paper that women tend to over volunteer for low payoff tasks, non promotable tasks. Who's so going to, you know, uh, you know, there's a faculty meeting, we need to, you know, have some sandwiches. Who volunteers to go get the sandwiches? Or who volunteers to take notes on the meeting? Or who volunteers to, you know, Rep, you know, look at, at their colleagues' papers and make comments on it. A lot of women uh, volunteer much more than men. These are non promotable tasks. You're not going to be recognized in the profession because of these tasks. But there is an expectation on everyone's parts, both women and men, that women should volunteer, should volunteer for this. 
And this expectation can, in fact, lead to a backlash. In other words, if you're not volunteering, people might be angry at you because their expectations are different for you than what they would be for a male colleague. So there's a whole gamut of, uh, of possible interventions. Part of it is understanding, and then a large part of it is building a culture to fight against this, to say, no, those tasks have to be shared. Let's not simply ask for volunteers. Let's put down the faculty and let's list them and everybody takes their turn. So this end of volunteerism might be very beneficial for women. Social networks, you know, social networks are so, so important for everything in economics. I mean, from who referees your paper, your editor, who gives you comments, uh, you know, who invites you to conferences. Women on the whole tend to have smaller social <coughs> networks. And that's something that we need to amplify. Yeah. And Ashwini, how do we get the men making the sandwiches? How do we change the culture fundamentally? <laughs> well, I can tell you that in the in my department at Ashoka, we've actually explicitly, we always make sure, you know, we, we have a very large proportion of women. And we make sure that when it's a question of a party or getting the sandwiches or whatever, we consciously allocate those tasks, you know, in a gender neutral fashion. So, but that's because there's a critical mass of women um, and, uh, you know, we are feisty, we are spunky and we we get the men to <laughs> share in those tasks. But it's absolutely true what Raquel said, which is about, you know, just the extension of the home. And by the way, that also extends to students. So when you look at mm -hmm. student evaluations, they are much harsher on female professors when they feel that the female professor has not been the mother, you know, like in a, <laughs> in a motherly caring figure. So men, male professors who are stern and firm on deadlines, et cetera, are, are given a very um, positive rating in sense he's firm, he's decisive, he's, you know, fair, et cetera. Whereas women, female professors will get a rating saying, oh, she's very rude, she is inflexible, et cetera. You know, so even with the same exact decision and even when female professors might actually be less strict than their male counterparts. So I think there's... Um, while uh, the younger people are, you know, explicitly in favor of gender equality, but I think there's a lot of implicit bias where you expect the women to extend their nurturing roles from the families to the workspaces. And, you know, so student evaluations they have a big problem in terms of, of differential gender evaluations. Just following up on that, how do you measure whether the IEA's initiative has been su a success? Well, IEA, as I said, is a network of different professional bodies across different countries. And I think what we would like to look for is how many of the country associations adopt at least some of the practices or some of the prescriptions that are going to come out of the project, start having conversations within their own countries. Because IEA cannot change the status quo in any, any country for that matter. And so we, we are hopeful that uh, A, in our December conference, annual congress, we are going to have a session in which we're going to talk about these issues. And over the course, the four year course of the project, we are going to keep on highlighting these issues through these kinds of fora, as well as in other, other forms. And we are hoping that the uh, uh, domestic economic associations, the country economic associations will take up uh, uh, some or all of the issues that the IE highlights. It's been I a real, I mean, go ahead. I I think the biggest way, the best way to change the culture is to change the numbers and to have more women. I think that will transform the discipline. And so I think, you know, we've done things at the LSE with things like pre-docs, where people who weren't thinking, who come from backgrounds, usually women, ethnic minorities, who don't come from backgrounds where they would expect to do a PhD, we give them pre-docs and we've allocated them specifically for underrepresented groups to help them enter a world of research in economics. And if they do well, they then we've earmarked specific PhD scholarships for underrepresented groups. And so I think getting the numbers up would be the biggest uh, source of success because I think that will change the culture of the discipline. And other disciplines have done better than economics. Medicine, law, engineering have done better than economics. So I think it is possible. Really interesting to get that comparison to other fields. It's been a real pleasure and an absolutely fantastic discussion. I've had the honour of chairing a number of panels on women and diversity in economics, and this has been absolutely one of the best. One question, though, to everyone just before we go, and just a sentence each, please. By the time I retire in 40 years, will I still be getting invitations to chair panels on this topic, or is there a chance it will all be resolved? Vera, you first. <laughs> 
I'm hoping it will be resolved. We have Minouche, we have Christine Lagarde, we have Ngozi, we have a lot of women now in economics and practical fields, and hopefully young girls can see that it leads to something real and concrete and will do it more. I definitely want to stop talking about this in 40 years. If I'm still alive. <laughs> Raquel? I agree. I think in 40 years, we will not be talking about this. Ashwini? Yeah, I agree that I think in 40 years, things will change a lot. I think you'll be chairing panels, which in honor, you know, major women achievers in different fields. So those are the kinds of panels you'll be, you'll be uh, chairing. I like it. Ending on an optimistic note. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you all so much for your contributions, for making this launch of Women in Leadership in Economics Initiative such a fantastic event. But most of all, thank you to you, the audience, for watching. It really wouldn't be anything without you. And please do visit the IEA-world.org website where you'll find lots more information about the IEA's Women in Leadership in Economics Initiative. I'm Lizzie Burden, and this has been What Economics is Missing, brought to you by the International Economic Association, together with Project Syndicate. Goodbye. <laughs>